Hello, I'm Eric Sperling. Thank you for joining All in Education's second season of Pake Sepas. All in Education is a local nonprofit organization that exists to build an Arizona where all students have access to opportunity and justice. Now, their work is focused on strengthening the Latino community by closing the representation gap to build power, influence, and authority across Arizona boardrooms and classrooms. All in Education hopes to shed light on the issues most impacting our communities through the Pake Sepas So You Know series. This program is focused on creating a space where real, thought-provoking conversations are had with leaders and community members working towards creating meaningful changes in the systems meant to serve our most vulnerable communities. Pake Sepas will feature a new episode every month focusing on a different topic. So let's get to today's discussion. I'd like to introduce Stephanie Parra, All in Education Executive Director. We also have Jeff Zatino back with us, Research and Policy Director at All in Education. And joining the conversation, we have Josh Zaragoza. He is a data analyst. So thank you for being here, Josh. Okay, Stephanie, let's get right to it. Um, you know, on last season's edition of Pake Cephas, we focused on the nine social determinants of education. Uh, these factors were identified by your organization as having major implications to education, uh, students and their families. And so as we open up this season, let's let viewers know what we can expect from season two of Pake Sepas. Yeah, it's an exciting it's day. It's very exciting, It's yes. a great day. We're here, season two kicking off. Um, you know, last year, like you said, we really wanted to unpack each social determinant and have the community understand how each determinant impacts um, educational attainment in our communities. And this year we wanted to take a deeper dive. Our MAPA report really highlighted the data analysis that Jeff and Josh will dive into um, in just a bit. And what we found in that research um, is that poverty, to nobody's surprise, poverty is the greatest barrier to educational attainment. We know that to be true as educators and practitioners. And so we wanna spend this year really unpacking how poverty is showing up in schools. All right, Jeff, let's get uh, your perspective on this as we looked at the social determinants of education there. Um, Stephanie talking about poverty carrying some greater weight than the other ones. Can you tell us more about um, how you came up with that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so just for a little bit of context, uh, in our MAPA report 2021-2022, we began to introduce this concept around the social determinants of education, right? And how the community impacts school systems and school systems impact the student's ability to learn. Um, so we wanted to take a deeper dive and really check our lived experience and our intuition mm -hmm. with some mathematical correlational relationships and really explore and see do they tie together, right? Can we actually see this coming up in the data? Uh, so we started to take a look at housing, uh, access to healthcare, uh, some family demographics, and some other community-based factors to see if there was a relationship between community factors and school performance. And we have the two data guys sitting next to each other, so we're excited <laughs> to continue this part. So, Absolutely. Josh, let's talk about uh, data analysis. Can you explain uh, the type of research you bring to this type of work, especially in the social sector? Yeah, absolutely. My uh, background, I, you know, I studied data science at uh, U of A and just have a, a deep history of loving data. And as you know, with the proliferation of the Internet and social media and different channels, data has been um, ubiquitous. And I think what, what I've learned and what we've learned is that, you know, you start have to start leveraging it because what this what this. Uh, research can do is actually be informative to nonprofits in uh, identifying gaps, trends, mm -hmm. but specifically and more importantly, where to apply resources and um, mm -hmm. where to uh, not only apply resources, but actually where to staff up, where what part of the community, identifying trends geographically and policy-wise. So I think it could be helpful. So before point. we talk more and we go deeper into that data, Jeff, Stephanie was talking about, you know, poverty um, and poverty being a multi-layered issue here. So can you give us a little more context of what she was talking about there and going into the multi-layered issues with poverty? Yeah, multi-layered, multi-dimensional, super complicated mm -hmm. work, right? Um, what we're seeing is that any one of these social factors that are tied to poverty have devastating effects on children, on families, on school systems, right? But I think one thing that we can sometimes lose track of is that when uh, we have one social factor that's tied to poverty, usually we have a conglomeration of other social factors that are, uh, that are tied to poverty. Okay. So for example, um, we talk about children showing up to school hungry, right? So there's a, a challenge in getting appropriate nutrition to children. So that's a sign of poverty. But 
that doesn't mean to say that's the only issue that that child is facing. Right. There's health care issues, there's transportation issues, mm -hmm. there's a uh, lack of access to stable housing issues. Uh, so it gets really complicated really quickly. And then another thing that kind of complicates the, oh, the whole issue is our country's historical stigmatization of poverty, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that someone lacks resources or is experiencing poverty, it's that they're less than or that there's something wrong with their character, or it's, it's, a, it's a stigmatization of what they're going through. Mm. So that's something that we need to kind of like uh, dig a little bit deeper into. And, and what we say dig deeper into is understanding that some of these indicators that we're seeing show up in school outcome measures are not because families are disinterested or that people lack character, is that there's some social factors that we need to address in order to ameliorate the situation. Take for example, uh, attendance rates. So for a long time, we've criminalized parents that don't, that don't have the ability to bring their children in a consistent basis to school. What we're seeing with our social determinants of education work is that when you scratch in, the, in a little bit beneath the surface, you start to see that it's transportation issues, housing issues, health issues, all of these things that we've been talking about. I know Stephanie's been talking a lot about chronic absenteeism. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh, let's go into that data now. Like, can you give us some specifics as to what some of the findings were when you were conducting some of this research? Absolutely, yeah, I think, um, well, first of all, the, what we did is we took census data and about, I don't know, about 10 different third-party data sources as well, and then we aggregated those using machine learning models, okay. and then um, whittled that down to about 30 different variables. And we found that there was anywhere from, and we really wanted to identify moderate to strong correlations with outcomes, you know, with school rankings. Um, and we found that, you know, students with, or schools with, uh, students with, you know, uh, on SNAP benefits, um, had free lunch, discount lunch, um, that impacted, had a strong correlation to the ranking of the school. Yeah, I think we're looking at a graphic right now on the screen. If you want to walk us through some of those other correlations, we can. Let me, and let me break down the actual strength of the yeah. correlation first. So actually moderate to strong, um, even though it says moderate, it's still stronger than a coin flip that it has an impact on the ranking okay. of the school. So even though it says moderate here, there are about three other um, degrees that are below moderate, you know, from, you know, from weak to all the way to moderate. But in this case, free discounted lunch had the strongest correlation. Being Latino had the strongest correlation right next to that. And then Title I schools, SNAP beneficiary, as I pointed out earlier, um, no access to health insurance, and those um, below poverty level, less than a high school graduate. So those are parents with less than a high school graduate. And those that were on public health insurance had a market. But there was two other ones I want to know. It was those families that were without a vehicle also had a moderate mm. um, correlation with school rankings. And those that come from single parent households. It didn't mother, matter if it was a mother or a father, but those that come from single parent houses also had a moderate correlation with school rankings. And Jeff, before I bring you into the conversation to go over some of those correlations, I do want to bring Stephanie back mm -hmm. in. And, you know, we're talking about poverty here, and it is such a big focus of all in education. Can mm -hmm. you talk more about why you're really focusing in on poverty this year? It's important because it, it, it has to do with educational attainment. So the correlation to school ranking means that that school performance is below, um, is underperforming. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at academic achievement and a student's ability to, to learn, if a child is showing up to school hungry because they haven't eaten all, all evening or all weekend, um, as educators, we have, to, we have to provide a meal, right? We have to make sure that they are fed. Um, and again, I think we've said this so much on Paquesepas, like we ask schools to be social service agencies mm -hmm. and we are not equipped to do that. And so we have to have this larger conversation around how the community is going to take action to address poverty. Otherwise, we're going to continue to have a very large population of, of kids, low income, of almost half of Arizona's uh, K-12 population is uh, classified as on the free and reduced price lunch, and a high population of Latino students. So we have to address this core issue um, if we're going to improve the quality of our educational system. And let's bring that graphic back up. Uh, Josh, uh, Jeff, and, and Stephanie too, anything that 
was shocking on this list or something that you didn't expect, Josh? Um, yeah, for me, I think uh, the health insurance, because initially when I started having this conversation with Jeff and Stephanie, you know, I looked at, uh, you know, educational rankings through the lens of strictly, you know, kind of the, the home environment and their environments at school. But something, you know, like health insurance, I didn't know whether or not they had access to it impacted how they performed at school and collectively how the school performed. Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, so like as, as, we, as the results were coming in and as we started thinking about like these results and these uh, correlations, for me what they start to do is that they start to paint the picture of poverty, right? Mm -hmm. So free and discounted lunch, uh, Title I benefits, SNAP beneficiary, these are all social safety net programs that are trying to ameliorate the conditions that some of our communities are experiencing day to day. Uh, another data, that, uh, data point that really stands out uh, that really hits ho close to home is parents with a less than a high school graduate uh, mm -hmm. certificate. Mm -hmm. Because to me, that really uh, begins to kind of paint the picture of this intergenerationality of lack of access to strong school systems. So if your parent, you know, for whatever reason, didn't complete high school or was pushed out of high school, then that child is more likely to experience a, a weakened or underperforming school system, mm -hmm. which further um, illuminates this these cycles of poverty, right? And the conditions that we're seeing some of our con uh, communities in, uh, the stagnation and 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 the 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 way that our, co our communities have a hard time coming out of poverty. I think that's that's really alarming. Stephanie, anything that stood out to you that you didn't quite expect? I think both of these, I, the one that was absolutely of no surprise was that it's poverty. I mean, I think mm -hmm. as an educator, we've been saying poverty is the greatest barrier to educational attainment as long as I can remember. Um, but as these things are layered on top of each other, one thing that I kind of take away is like, if a, if a family is experiencing poverty, yeah, they might not have access to health insurance. They're right. probably not, um, they didn't complete high school, right? Like, so there's all of these, um, the outcomes were kind of stacked on each other. So, you know, what are we doing when we are setting up this community um, for failure, right? So for me, it's like, what are we going to do now that we have the data? How are we gonna collectively take action uh, to solve some of these problems? So Jeff, how do you think that information is gonna help shape the conversations we're gonna be having in the coming episodes, especially obviously around poverty? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Stephanie alluded to it, right? Like taking a deep dive into poverty and taking that stigma away from it and giving ourselves license to really think about this really complex and difficult issue to engage in. Um, there is this stacking of different uh, social factors that are tied to poverty. Um, we have to understand the holistic impact and also the individual impacts that healthcare, nutrition, housing have on the, out, the academic outcomes within our communities. So it begs the question, if we need to support communities, then what is our state and what are we doing to support mm -hmm. these communities and what communities are we supporting? How are we defining uh, high quality uh, schools? Uh, how is our community defining high quality schools? What schools are, are, are able to meet the needs, whether it's cultural, linguistic, social economic, or social emotional needs of our students? And can we map out our communities, right? Like where in our community are children having appropriate access to quality schools? And where in our community are we building school, uh, high quality school deserts? School deserts, can you expand on that a little bit? Because that's well, just interesting when it hits my ear. Yeah, yeah. yeah There's food deserts. We're familiar yeah, with so deserts. it's kind yeah. of like building upon that concept around food deserts, right? Food deserts being uh, a children in an under-resourced community probably doesn't have access to appropriate food, vegetables, high-nutrient mm -hmm. uh, nutrition because those communities have overabundance of liquor stores and no yeah. uh, access to whole foods. Um, and it's the same thing with education. If our children don't have access to a strong local school, then they don't have access to, a, to opportunity. And Stephanie, a great starting point for these conversations is mm -hmm. the MAPA report, right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So the, the MAPA report, we hope, um, Josh kind of alluded to this, we think, we firmly believe our work with MAPA is helping to shed light on the data um, and to start the conversation 
uh, to help inform the people who are making decisions mm -hmm. about where to appropriate resources, where mm -hmm. to staff up and where to expand capacity, where to address where those uh, quality school deserts are. Um, and so our hope is that MAPA can kind of really be that magnifying glass uh, that folks will look to and they can download the report at allineducation.org slash MAPA. Um, it's our, you know, it's our tool uh, to give community leaders uh, something to look to uh, again when they're making decisions for us. So as we start to close this conversation out and we're talking about community leaders, Josh, I'll ask you like, what is your short term and then maybe long term ask of community leaders? Well, from my point of view, is to use as much as their voice power to advocate um, down at the legislature or anyone that may have influence on um, our local legislators and, you know, for more resources for our local schools and public schools that have more resources is, I think, number one key. Because even though we, we look at this and you see the poverty level, that is something the government attributes and it's somewhat arbitrary, you know, arbitrary. And even families that earn 100000 or less have a lot of these poverty attributes. Mm -hmm. So really, these, this applies to 70% or more of the families in, this, in Arizona. So I think lobbying legislators and advocating on behalf of education down there. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? You know, we talk a lot on this series about, yes, it, politicians, but also business leaders, nonprofit leaders. Mm -hmm. What's the short-term, long-term ask here? Yeah, definitely. I just kind of wanted to uh, highlight what Josh was saying. Like, it's such an important point that this isn't a Latino issue or a low income issue. Over 70 percent of Arizona families don't have access to quality schools. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as income rises over $100,000 a year for any particular family, they have over representation in high quality schools. Mm -hmm. So on both ends, um, it's becoming an issue. Absolutely. So for so for us, um, I think our short term ask is, you know, follow us on this series, like mm -hmm. take this journey with us. Let's take this deep dive into poverty month to month. Uh, please join us and tune in. Uh, secondly, for anybody that that finds that these conversations are resonating with them, um, and, and, and want to follow our work, please visit us at alleneducation.org. And also we have a, an abundance of leadership development programs for parents, for community leaders, or for people that are ready to mm -hmm. take the plunge and become an elected official. Uh, alleneducation.org, read about our leadership development programs and get involved. Yeah, there's so much work obviously that happens off camera in the work you guys are doing. And <laughs> yeah. this is where we just get to come together and make these calls to actions and talk about some of the repeatable positives. Stephanie, how about you, um, short term, long-term vision kind of call to action here for community leaders yeah i think short term coming together um, using the data as a tool to inform the folks that are making decisions whether it's a funder who's investing in an organization mm -hmm. or investing in a community or a policymaker who's deciding whether or not they're going to mm -hmm. put more resources behind our our k-12 education system i think the, that MAPA can be leveraged as a tool to help inform the people making decisions and then long term i would say we we can't we have to get to the day where schools are no longer expected to be social service mm. agencies mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. how are we going to bring the that collaborative together um, whether it's you know folks from the healthcare field housing transportation city leaders state leaders local school board members everybody coming together and saying like okay it's not acceptable that we expect so much from our title one schools mm -hmm. what are we going to do collectively to support them I think one of my takeaways was something you said about, you know, breaking the stigma a little bit where, yes, you look at something, well, it's all about how hard you work and that's how, that's how you're going to achieve success. But there's so many other barriers that are mm -hmm. keeping a student from attaining those educational goals, right? right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. We thank you, Stephanie, Josh, thank you. Thank Jeff. You. Thank you. What a great conversation. We thank you all for joining us for All in Education's Pocket Sepas. What a great way to kick off the second season of the Social Determinants of Education. As a reminder, we will continue building on the conversation every month, bringing you a deep dive conversation on each one of the topics. Um, thank you guys so much for providing clarity on this topic. I'm excited to see how this conversation unfolds throughout the year. And please make sure you tune in next month as we explore again what poverty can mean for education. Thank you so much for joining us. We do want to thank the Garcia Family Foundation for supporting the series, all the work they do to make this series possible. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.